Register for our completely free Azure Solutions Architect Expert Bootcamp running June 14th through June 18th. Don't miss this free and unique learning experience. We look forward to seeing you there. Hi, this is Michael Gibbs, and we're here for another episode where we're going to have a fantastic discussion. Today, I am here with Paxton, and he's the CEO of Concept Elements, LLC, and he's got an innovative weather solution to save lives, save money, and make the world a better place. And I'm really excited to talk to Paxton today because he's got a cloud-based weather application. Many people may not know this about me, but I was an EMT paramedic for seven years. And I was a nurse and a nurse practitioner that practiced internal medicine. And I have seen a tremendous number of fatalities from traffic-related accidents. And anything we can do to make the world safer or a better place is really incredible. And that's why we're here today to really talk about things that we can actually do to make the world a better place. And with that, I have Paxton, who's the CEO of Concept Elements. Now, Paxton has invented a cloud-based technology, one for pilots, He's got another one for generic weather, and he's got another one for driving. And here's the thing. The weather can have a massive impact on accidents. It has a massive impact for flying, but it also does for driving. There's 1.2 million traffic-related accidents per year that are weather-related. Now, this is a lot of accidents. And if we can plan ahead, we might be able to mitigate some of these things. And that's why I'm super excited to have Paxton. Now, Paxton started this company to make the world safer, but he started it because he's a pilot. In fact, when I was talking to Paxton, he told me why he started this. So Paxton, could you tell the world why you started this great application? Sure, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so my, my first app is a WX24 pilot, and I'm a private pilot, and I was flying my kids out to the Badlands one time. And um, in, I used to fly a small plane, and in a small plane, you have to do a lot of weather checking. Um, you, I don't have the ability to fly over it like the commercial jets do or get rerouted. Uh, and you're flying very slow, so you, you encounter, you have a longer time that you could encounter various different weather and changes in the weather. So um, the weather is very important to check. It's really life and death. And actually a lot of deaths in uh, aviation have to do with weather, especially the general, general aviation world. And so I had uh, did I did my flight planning and I took off and I flew and I think you know, I was left out of Chicago and then uh, I think somewhere out of like Western Iowa, I saw this cloud bank ahead, and it was from my um, flight planning it was supposed to be clear pretty much the whole way, and so uh, as I, was, I went I decided to go underneath this cloud layer and then uh, I, it kept on pushing me low to the ground and eventually it just Drop from uh, drop from above and just enveloped me, and I was in the clouds. Now, this is a, a typical scenario where a lot of pilots get killed, but training kicks in, and you're taught how to deal with this. And you basically do a U-turn because the plane could um, fly much faster than any weather. Uh, I did that. I, I could not get out. I, I don't know what happened, but I could not find my way out of this out of the clouds. And so, you know, I called up ATC and you know made connection with them. And uh, they gave me a vectors and an altitude fly at, and, and everything was safe at that point. As soon as they see you, they could guide you. They, they see everybody and they know what's going on. So, but that, that experience led me to develop these apps. Um, I had this idea about, and it's really, my apps are all about visualization. Like, I think in all the, in all the, like the data products there are, there's so much data, but you have, the, the key is being able to understand it quickly and easily. And so that's, that's basically what I did. I took a, basically a 15, 20 minute process of this flight planning down to just a few seconds, just in the visual nature of the app. And that just a lot frees my mind up to focus on other things. So I, that was in 14. Um, I think that was in actually in 13. I developed the first one in 14 and then I released it in like January of 2015. So you said 15 minutes to 15 seconds. Something like that. I, that's incredible. I'm looking at the finances of this. You know, if an average pilot is paid $75 an hour and we can save 15 minutes per pilot per flight and a flight applies three flights a day, four flights a day, we could conceivably save an hour per day per pilot. Yeah. Yeah. And they, not only get our people there safer. And I don't know if this is true, but I heard that 23% of aviation accidents are related to weather. 
That's about right. That's about right. So, I mean, you're really saving lives, but you can also be saving some substantial money with this along the way. So I heard you say it's cloud-based, and we're all kind of cloud-crazy here. We love the cloud. So, you know, obviously, you've got to get a data source. And clearly, when it comes to things like normalizing data, you need some databases. And are you making the visualization tools, or are you using things? Like, actually, but tell me how that works, because, you know, I so, find these things fascinating. Sure. So I, I pull the data from the weather data from a number of sources. Um, I use different weather models. Um, I use the aviation weather data uh, from the FAA and then also the National Weather Service. I pull their weather data in. Um, there's weather data from for Canada, the U.S. and Europe. Um, and I basically pull all that data together. It, and it's, you know, so weather data is huge amounts of information. Some of it is very granular down to the hour. And you're talking about hundreds of weather parameters to look at. Um, I don't, I don't sh represent all those, but we take in a lot of information. You can make calculations based on some of these other things like density, alt altitude. Um, and so all this diff varying data comes in every hour. Um, or when there's an update, and then it part my my uh, all the servers are on AWS. It parses all the data, and throws it in Postgres. Um, so w w one of the things I do is I have to massage this data such that it's easy for the apps to represent to um, visualize. It, you know, you have when you're developing an app, it has to be quick. It, there's no way in that, uh, the way that I have developed my apps, they could pull the data direct the raw data directly and process it. It just, it's not possible. And so I do uh, a lot of processing ahead of time. So then I throw it in the uh, Postgres and then any calls for the weather come in from the apps. The, the, you know, it's already in a, in a format where the apps could use efficiently. Love that. So you don't need a data visualization tool like a tabular or something. You made your own. Yeah. Fantastic. And that, so you basically build a front end to go hit what's on your servers. That's right and make it easy to view. I love that. And I know what it's like. I know a fair amount about temperature, humidity, and wind, and how that can affect uh, certain vectors. And I can't even imagine being up there and dealing with this. Now, I used to fly, well, 300,000 miles a year, and I've been in some serious in incidents, everything where plane engines have failed and we've had to dump fuel. Oh, we've right. been hit by weather and things weren't good. So having someone out there, you know, that's just amazing that I love that you're doing it. So you know, the cloud doing this is great because it's there and, you know, it's going to scale as you need it. Yes. Where's the future for this? Where's your next version 80, 80.1, 2.1, 3.1, 4.1? Because I think this is fascinating. So I'm always making updates and tweaks and improvements. There's like never a sh shortage of uh, things to improve, um, new features. Just And it's all, all the apps are designed around decision making. Like I just present the weather data for the for the user to make those decisions uh right now though i'm putting a hold on uh, new features i'm still making like minor fixes here and there and you know ui tweaks but uh, i'm moving into the sales arena i haven't done i haven't been i've kind of relied on seo to drive all the sales and that's been really effective anytime there's a storm uh you know the uh sales go up downloads go up and then sales go up so um, it takes a lot of effort, as you know, to develop these new features and they have to work together. You got to test them every which way and then you still miss stuff. It, it's just an incredible amount of effort. And uh, when you have, you know, hundreds of thousands of users on these apps relying on you, you have to make sure you do a good job. And so it's, it's pretty intense work, but and I, I'm, I'm at the point now where um, I think it's proven to me. This, the business model has been proven and now I have to start really promoting it and selling it. I like it. I, so I live in South Florida. Okay. And with regards to extreme weather, well, yeah. let's just say this year I've already replaced four different appliances from power surges. Really? And I have a whole home surge protector on my house. I drive a car. And you know what? I drive four-wheel drive in my vehicle for the following reason. It rains so bad here. It's going to be sunny, yeah. sunny, sunny. And then poof, you've right. got 60-mile-an-hour crosswinds and rain. So... Yeah, for me, this is really great. Something that I could actually check on because the Apple Weather app does not give me what I need for driving. Right. Here. And three o'clock this afternoon, there's a 40% chance of rain. Okay, great. <laughs> now I leave my house. It's bright, sunny. I go five minutes. And now I've got 60 mile an hour crosswinds and rain that's so deep that it flooded the ground in the first three minutes. 
and you can't even see anything at all with yeah, your windshield right. wipers, no matter how fast they go. Exactly. Because I used to live in a cold weather climate, and they get some scary cold weather too. Yeah, yeah. So I love the concept of giving people access, but you know, let's talk about the statistics of motor vehicle crashes. How many people get hurt in motor vehicle crashes related to weather? There's um, about 1.2 million annual accidents due to weather every year in the U.S. and about five and five thousand of those are fatalities. Wow! So that's a huge amount, and that's just weather related. Um, I mean, every so often you see in the news is a there's a fog on the highway and there's a huge pileup or snow or some type of freezing rainstorm, and uh, just the awareness that that's out there or that's in the forecast. I mean, they could save a life, and it's the amount of damage. The, the dollars is incredible. Yes, I mean, dollar volume, dollars lost a life. You know, not. Some of my team showed me that $900 is the average cost of a car accident in the U.S. So $1.2 million times $900, that's a lot of money. Yes. So it's you know, that's money that could drive down insurance costs to make things cheaper on people. That's money that could drive down health care costs because when people get injured, you know, in car accidents, some of these injuries cost, you know, millions of dollars in medical yes. care. Right. Yeah. And uh, some people, you know, have life changing things. I've dealt with a lot of patients when I used to practice medicine that were wheelchair based or life change or people can't even get out of a wheelchair, or even use their arms or legs after a car accident and not having those because we can avoid it via weather. That's life changing. It's pretty huge. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, for that, that's pretty interesting to me. So to me, it's about how do we make it better? And I like that you're using the cloud. Did you try this in the data center first? Or did you go straight to the cloud? No, I just, I, I have an IT background. I was consulting in Chicago for so long. So it's just a natural um, to throw it on the cloud. And it's all, everything's on AWS. Their, their systems are really efficient and managing everything. I could, you know, in the wintertime, I get a lot of traffic. I just ramp up new servers instantly um, to handle everything. Yeah, and being an IT guy for the last 25 years too, it's, I kind of go to the cloud too in most cases. If I need extreme performance, I'm still using the data center and the network because so I can get a little better performance and a little greater security. But for like 95% of things now, it's just so much easier to go to the cloud. A couple of mouse clicks and you've got a server, no calling Dell or IBM right. or HP and yep. waiting six weeks. Yep. I mean, pay for what you use yep. versus, you know, yeah. Very what you efficient. need. Very efficient. And especially when you're starting something up, I like it. And it's going to grow and scale. Now, what kind of availability requirements do you need right now versus where you're going for? Um, availability is, I mean, it's like 24 seven. I, people are searching whether all over, you know, uh, every, every minute of the day. And, and in addition, I have a UK weather there. So it's different time zones. I'll be opening up the rest of the Europe um, probably by the end of this year or, you know, beginning of next year. So it's, it's just 24-7 operation. I get 24-7, but do you need to maintain 99.999%? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, as, as many nines as I could get. And I've, I've done pretty good. I, I don't track that so much. Um, I have backup systems. When one goes down, another one picks up okay. right off. It's, it's um, you know, all the time. Okay, and, and I get it. So I'm used to the, the four nines, the five nines, you know. Didn't know if you're using multiple clouds or two regions and two availability zones or how much backup and redundancy you need for a weather up. Um, so the, the, the processing is, I would say, it's intensive. There's a lot of volume, but it's not terribly complicated. Okay. There's some complex, complexity to it. So, and it's been tested, like I test constantly. So it's, it's pretty rock solid. I have, um, it's two different regions running, um, and so, you know, I got the high availability on Postgres, um, multiple, multiple API interfaces. If one goes down and another one pops up, they're, they're um, load balanced. Um, as I see the load increase, I'll take, I, you know, analyze it every few months. And, and so th this is kind of like, you know, I, I kind of do this work myself. I get some help now and then. So I kind of just peek in, I set it up. Like I, it, it's, um, uh, 
you basically do the best you can until you figure, you run to a roadblock and you hire you know an expert at it. And so I've done pretty well so far. And it and it's you know, you know, yeah. once in a while there's a you know, <laughs> once in a while there's I think uh, actually AWS had a DNS issue for like one minute and I had like, I don't know, maybe like 500 emails that came in. Um, yeah, that was why I was asking the question. So uh, you know, when AWS has an eight hour outage because of an impaired network or they have a global outage due to a power failure. I was wondering how many thousands of emails you get inside of five minutes. I got like, I, yeah, I got like 500 emails and it was, it was like for a minute or two, it was a DNS, it, it, the database was, uh, they couldn't find the database. This is the DNS issue, and it was it was resolved uh, pretty quickly, but it generated um, yeah a little panic there. Yeah, I use uh, multiple cloud systems too, and they have a hiccup, and I've got about thirty emails within five minutes. Hey, wait, what's going on? I'm like, let me check the AWS cloud. I'll let you know. Okay, there we go. Yeah, but, then uh, I usually get the blame for it because nobody knows behind the scenes what's going on. Well, thankfully in my world. We're dealing with mostly cloud architects and they know that generally speaking, we use multiple clouds for the reason of high performance and high availability. But our SaaS provider that we're using our service from is only on one cloud. So we're like, we feel it every time there's a cloud hiccup. But, mm -hmm. you know, whether, you know, as you get bigger and critical, this could be something that could really make a difference in a lot of people's lives. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I get uh, the comments that I think they get. The I get three emails a week saying how how grateful people are, how how much it saved them, took the stress out of their drive. It just helped them plan. Like um, people are very appreciative of the effort I put in, which is yeah. nice because it's and a lot of effort. And anybody that's been in a near miss flight situation like I have will definitely appreciate safety, safety, and more safety. Yes. So the reason I have more appreciation than the average bear for this is as follows. When I was a kid, I was a paramedic. Okay. I probably paid my way through school. Now, there's usually an EMT driving the ambulance and a paramedic in the back. Mm -hmm. In a single month, I was in 14 accidents. Wow. And when you're starting an IV on somebody in the back of an ambulance, you can't be wearing a seatbelt. So some of these accidents, I'm trying to start an IV, poof, I hit the front of the ambulance. I you know Jeez. some of these things were bad. 14 ambulance accidents in one month, and I've got all the herniated discs to prove them too. And you know, there's that. And should these paramedics had better information? Hey, wait, there's some kind of weird black ice over there that you can't see. It's hidden. Would have been helpful. Yeah. Gusts of uh, winds mean, in an ambulance that have a giant box on it. Right. Or a problem. And something like this that we could have known about could have been like, all right, guys, we know it's bad. It's critical to get there, but maybe we get there 60 seconds slower. Okay. But at least we get there. Right. Because, you know, we're overzealous. Let's get there as fast as we can. We want to help. We want to do good. But we're no good to anybody if we're dead. Right. So let's say I want to use your drive weather app. Okay. And I want to go visit my chief operating officer, Chris, who's over there in St. Petersburg. I want to leave my home in Port St. Lucie. How's it work? Oh, you, it's that it's like Google Maps. You just put your destination in, start at your location if you got you know uh, location services enabled, and then you press the button. It finds the finds the fastest route for you, and then it plots all the weather along the right way. So one of the unique aspects is is uh, I would say it's high resolution data in the sense of I there's like every five miles there's a weather location that represents the weather. So it's a, a it's a very dense network of weather because the more information you have, uh, and the more information is presented, um, it allows you to make more informed decisions, as opposed to maybe you know your destination in one place in the middle. You got two weather locations; it's not going to do you any good. And then you have an interactive time slider. So at the bottom, all the weather is calculated at the time that you would arrive at each point, you know, each of those five mile in increments. And so with the Interactive time slider, you can slide the departure time back and forth and see the effect of the weather. So if there's a, if you leave now, like for example, if you would leave now and there's thunderstorms on the way, you just move the time slider over a, a few hours and you could see the effect of that, like they would, you know, dissipate maybe, or maybe there's something, high winds come in. So it just allows you to, um, part, part of the uh, successful apps have to be super easy to use. Nobody wants to try and understand a new app or trying to figure it out. So this one is uh, really incredibly easy. Everybody knows how to do a search on a map on, 
on uh, Google or whatever. And it's a similar concept. Start destination, you could add waypoints. If you're going long distances, you, you could add a stop overnight and we'll track the difference for you in the weather and you know accurately represents with any stops you add in there. So it can really makes, change the experience. Pardon? It'll really change the experience because I always think about it. And I'm like, hmm, do I wait for the storm to end or is it going to get worse? Yeah. And and like so if you're two hours from now and there's a storm there now, but by the time you get there, it's going to be gone. You don't have to wait for it, right? Like right. it just helps like kind of optimize and plan your route and just better situational awareness. It's if you know it's going to be clear the way the whole way, well, then it gives you a certain type of comfort, right? You don't have to wonder what's going to be ahead, right? Uh, e even if it is clear, right? That it, it just helps. I can't help think in my mind that in the future, this has got some really good military applications. The I'm concept sure. of getting wind speed humidity wind direction temperatures weather you know now it may need to be a little more real-time data but i can in the future but i see this as a this could be hugely useful in the industry but also in other industries as well industries where you're digging industries where you're doing construction industries where you're working on roads i mean i could see a lot of potential for this yeah, I, actually, I got a, a recent request for the insurance industry um, to use the API so that they could uh, drill in and verify claims. Um, and it's really, you know, all this data is out there. This, this is nothing new, but it's in the presentation of it. And when you have a clear presentation that parses all this and just presents what you need to know, I mean, that's a game changer. Ah, oh, which gets into more computer and technology. Gives me a chance to get a little geeky. So when you're parsing through it, is it something that's CPU based, like Python, Spark, et cetera? Or is it like a GPU based machine learning algorithm that's going to parse through it, like using something like a TensorFlow or a PyTorch or something? No, it's a CPU based. It's okay. just logic that I've written that um, examining, you know, what the puts a priority on different weather conditions and um, categorizes it and then just um, converts into a J, basically JSON in a, in a okay. elegant way so that the app could just instantly pick it up. Ah, makes sense. That's a good way to normalize it. Very simple, straightforward, not adding a ton of complexity, which in architecture is elegance. Right. <laughs> the less complexity, the more it's going to work, the less bugs you're going to have. So I really right, right. That. And, and actually, I would say it takes a lot of effort to be simple. Like it's easy Much to more. be messy. But when you have a, a very elegant solution, it takes a lot of thought and examining the data to see what, what's necessary, what isn't, what's, you know, duplicate or what's overlapping and, and to make it efficient um, and just designed for the client. Um, yeah, it takes a lot of thought into that. You know, Paxton, you bring up a really good point, which is really critical. So I remember years ago when I did an MBA and Chris on my other end of the phone was also in the MBA, you know, write us a 20 page paper that includes this, 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 and this. What they should have been is, hey, don't write a 20-page paper ever. Learn how to take that 20 pages of stuff and shrink it into two pages so it's simple and elegant. Because the reality is simple and elegant works. You know, I've been designing and teaching architects for 25 years now, and it's like I can tell the really good engineers that are not that I need to take a step back. They show me something and it's got complexity, 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 complexity. And honestly, even to think of it, they're extreme geniuses. And then it's like, have you ever heard of Occam's razor? And they're like, what's that? And I say, the simplest solution is usually the best. And I say, it took you an IQ of 170. You're like Einstein to be able to think of this. But now let's bring it back so it's going to work. They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, this is too complicated. This is too complicated. Imagine what happens when data flows through it. They simplify it. And wow, it's really good. So it's great. It's very hard to produce something simple. In fact, yeah, it's, 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 it's funny you brought up the issue that the, the, you started off your... your about the you know 200 page document like in school right we're all taught write five pages write a thousand more whatever it is but it that's so archaic in the mm -hmm. sense of everything in the business world is about being very poignant and and quick if you're in an elevator with a, a you know an investor and you got your elevator pitch you, yeah. you're gonna want to you got one sentence you got a few seconds you better have that dialed in but yep. what do we teach the kids right as much as you want right and that's just that's like a wrong way of thinking about the, the realities of the world 
It really is. And, you know, I've got friends that are pilots too, and I've got some friends from the Marine Corps that are pilots, but those that learn the simple way, they're really, they had to learn a, a different way. When I first worked in technology, I was working in networking. The routers we had at the time could do less than two megabits per second of throughput, and they had a 15 to 20 megahertz CPU. And, you know, if you were lucky, two megs of RAM. Yeah, right. How good were those application developers to write those code, to right. work on those systems? Right. They were like the world's greatest. We network architects and engineers in those days were like, okay, this router can handle 200 routes. So how do we yeah, aggregate, geez. summarize, hide, do this just to keep the system from crashing? Right, right. Now it's like, okay, we've got 32 cores. Now what? But you know what? It's still the simplicity and elegance of the old days is still what you need. Yeah. yeah. So love what you're doing. Love the mission. Do you have any thoughts or things that my audience should know about you and your app? Because, you know, when I hear about your apps, you know, I find them to be really great with regards to what they're doing. I love the concept of drive weather. I'm going to download that right now. So the next time I drive somewhere, I'm not going to be blindsided. But, you know, your WX24 pilot, WX24 pilot wow. I'm going to call my buddy Chris tomorrow. He's an airplane pilot. He's also a retired airline captain, but he's also a sniper from the Marine Corps, and he loves this kind of stuff. And the first thing he's going to ask me, like, is, hey, wait, do we get wind, temperature, humidity? And he's going to say, density, altitude, do I get it? I'm like, no, you can calculate. He's like, I know how to calculate. I'm a pilot. But, but you know, those are the things. But in either case, it really doesn't matter because um, we calculate it anyway. And the concept of atmosphere, weather, I just love it. I really do. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, actually the aviation one is, um, so it visualizes TAFs. TAFs are the, the typical, the, it's the most accurate and actionable information that pilots have to base for the weather decisions off of. Um, and so, it, and they're, they quite complex in, in, in how they're represented. They can be the, the military ones are actually the military TAFs and TAFs are issued at each airport at each larger airport, I should say, and the military airports have much more data in it because I guess, you know, it's higher stakes. Um, and so it's able to visually represent this, you know, alphanumeric code really well. And then I have a, an ability to um, look at the raw code so you could kind of, it helps learning. So you can look at the raw TAF, the alphanumeric, and kind of translate it into what the visual representation is. So th that app is... Um, uh, yeah, that was my first one. A lot of, lot of, again, a lot of innovative thought went into the, the, the visual aspect of it. And again, the data is all there. Everybody has access to the same data. You can, you can find weather, aviation weather anywhere, but it's how it's presented that takes away the, the burden of you trying to figure it all out or the pilot trying to figure it out and, and have also a sense of, um, a surety or comfort that this is what's represented. It's all visual, like right? a picture is worth a thousand words, right? And so it's so easy to look at a photograph or an image and, you know, get what it's saying rather than read the equivalent. And, but, and it's, it's the fact that, look, the data's out there. I agree with you, but getting data from here, 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 and here, not knowing what's current, what's fresh, what's good, what's real, it, it, it's too much. It's information overload. Yeah. In the end, you know so little about so many things that you really don't have anything without it. So anytime you can narrow it down and give you a focus, give you a dashboard, I'm all for it. I think it adds to safety. You know, it's like in the hospital. We got data coming from everywhere. Oh, yeah, I bet. Like, I bet. All right, now what do I really need to think about? Which, which noise do I need to tune out so I can focus on what I really need to know? I want my pilot focused on flying that airplane. Right. You know, not thinking about other stuff. And if they're thinking about too many other things and not focusing on that plane, oh, maybe, maybe in a 747 with a co-pilot and an autopilot, it might be on a big plane that's hard to blow around. It might be a little less risky, but not every plane's huge like that. Right. And even still, look at all those lives in the back of the plane. I still want a tool like this. So, you know, I'm really impressed. Is there anything else you want to tell anybody else about your software? Um, if you could go to my website, uh, the driveweatherapp.com is the one for the drive weather. And then wx24pilot.com is the aviation weather app. Um, the, I guess it, it's all about decision-making, you know, I present all the information and allow you to make your decisions how you need to. And, and that's, that's kind of, when I started this, that's what my need was. Like I was my own client at the beginning. 
what did I need to do? And it's, um, I don't throw a lot of all sorts of other junk in these apps. They're just very singular. It's very specific and it's very simple then. And nobody has time to learn the ins and outs of a new app. And so I try and make them as simple and as visual as I can. But I love it. You were the first customer. So I'll end it on this. I used to work at Cisco and I love Cisco. At Cisco, we had an expression. It was called eat your own dog food. And what that really meant is everything we made at Cisco was based on upon a business problem we had or knew about. And we used our own gear for everything. And, you know, when you're in a company with like 80,000 people and half of them are engineers, they're going to push the limit of that stuff to break it. So right. we used to test it on ourselves and break it. Now, I called it eating your own dog food, which is what the company used to call it. And then we brought in one of the C-level executives and he says, let's talk about sipping your own champagne. I'm like, what's that? He's like, using your own gear. And I'm like, oh, so eating your own dog food. He's like, no, 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 yeah, sipping your right. own champagne. I'm like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so whatever world, the case right? is, however we want to pack it the dog food world, right? <laughs> yeah, but here's the thing. I want to know that I used the product. You had a problem. You survived the problem. And you built something to make the world a safer place, to make the world a better place, to make sure that other people don't have it. Paxton, thank you for doing it. Thank you for making the world a better and safer place and doing it with cloud-based technologies. That's why we're here on our thank Go Cloud you. Careers, Go Cloud Architects channel, because anytime we can make the world better through the cloud, we love it. Paxton, thank, thank you. you so much for your time. Thank you for what you're doing. Can't wait to go download the Atmospheric Weather app right now and the Drive Weather app right now. And I'm going to call my buddy Chris over there and tell him about the WX24 pilot. He's going to love it. Thanks a lot. I appreciate the time. And thank you so much, Paxton. All right. Have a good day. You too. It was so nice having you join us for this video today. Let me tell you about some free services we do for the cloud community. We have a free how to get your first cloud architect job webinar where we tell you all the things you need to do and know to get your first cloud architect job. In addition to that, we actually have a free question and answer session on live on YouTube, where you can come and ask us any questions you want about building your career related to cloud computing or networking, and we'll answer them in real time for you because we want to get you to your goals. Several more times per week, we have guests from industry, industry experts that I've known for decades that are movers and shakers that have changed the world that can give you information so you can build the best career. I invite them periodically. They are on my show. If there's a chance to do some free training on our channel, we'll do it live because we want you to all to have the best skills for the best career. So please subscribe and hit the bell. I look forward to seeing you and I look forward to assisting you in your technology career. Thank you so much. This is Michael Gibbs from Go Cloud Architects.